I'm standing here in Carbondale, Illinois, a town of about 25,000. Behind me are shotgun houses, and the essential expression of rural humility and pragmatism. There are only about one or two rooms wide and a couple rooms deep. They are affordable, formulaic, and radically different from the scenery of Chicago. Over two and a half million people live in this bustling metropolis towering over the prairie. Proud of its diversity and powerful because of its trade, Chicago leads America past and present. Life in Carbondale is slower and opportunities fewer. However, there is still one piece of culture that unites this varied state and the nation, architecture. Behind me is Fainer Hall on the main campus of one of Carbondale's largest employers, Southern Illinois University. It was built in the 1960s and the architects very consciously used an urban aesthetic, the international style. The style was developed, in part, in Chicago. However, those Chicagoan architects never came close to Carbondale. So, what sort of international encounters and invisible artistic exchanges occurred to allow such a style move across the country? For the answer, we'll have to journey to Chicago ourselves and to another college, the Illinois Institute of Technology, where we'll discover the story of a pioneer. This is the story of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe was born on March 27, 1886 in Aachen, Germany. He had been trained as a stonemason. His father was a stonemason. He then kind of segued into architecture, apprenticed with Peter Behrens, who was the leading architect in Germany at the time. Under Behrens, Mies was exposed to radical new ideas in architecture. As a young architect full of skills and willing to experiment, he fit in well with the burgeoning modernist movement, which called for a new architecture to fit the changing times. It boldly discarded the grand facades of previous buildings, favoring simple geometry and clear, flat lines and design. Modern materials like glass were used, placing a building's function over its form, a philosophy that drove Mises' work and was introduced to him and many Europeans by Frank Lloyd Wright. He published a portfolio of his work in Germany. It came to be known as the Vossmuth Portfolio, and there was an exhibition of the drawings in Berlin, close to the office where Mies was working. This was the office of Peter Behrens. Behrens apparently would take the people from the office to see the exhibition over lunchtime. Um, and Mies says he saw the exhibition then and saw, and what impressed him about Wright's work was that he had a complete view of architecture. His architecture made a general claim rather than a specific claim. And in Wright he saw an architecture with which you could design a dwelling and you could also design a city, so you could go from the small to the large. Mies aligned himself with modernism early in his career. In 1927, he sent a now famous letter to an architecture periodical supporting the modernists. He wrote, We are neither antiquity nor the Middle Ages, and life is neither static nor dynamic, but includes both. I think it is more important to direct the currents of spiritual situation in which we stand than to evaluate it. Some people call classical architecture timeless. Yeah. See, he would Architecture is of its time and place. There's no timeless architecture. But soon, the rising star of the modernists would become their leader. In 1919, fellow architect Walter Gropius founded the Bauhaus, an art school that became a capital of modernism. In 1930, Mies became the Bauhaus's director and effectively the leader of European modern architecture. It was during his directorship that the international style got its name. The idea of the international style, the term itself, was invented by a couple of then historians, uh, Professor Henry Russell Hitchcock uh, and the curator of architecture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, a man named Philip Johnson. They together made an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1932. And really came out of the catalog that was written for the exhibit by Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson, where they labeled it, and I wrote it down exactly, the international style architecture since 1922. 
but it was a lot of Mises buildings. It's an attractive term, a stylus international. This is great. This is modern. This is up to date. The world, it's, it's a global um, system. It's not tied to a particular place. But then at the height of Mises fame in Europe, catastrophe struck. Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933 and with him dawned the Nazi crusade against modern art. Works were destroyed and the Bauhaus closed, although Mies, a Catholic, was one of the last to leave after attempting to reopen the Bauhaus. Mises did not consider the Bauhaus architecture, the, the international style, he considered it to be Bolshevik, Oriental, and I don't mean like Chinese or Japanese Oriental, I mean Eastern Europe Oriental, uh, Jewish, and they, they considered it, they didn't want, and, and it didn't represent the fatherland. The Nazis closed it, he reopened it, and then closed it again. Meanwhile, IIT needed a new dean of architecture. Mises' influence was already felt in Chicago at this point, making sympathetic architects recommend him, especially since Gropius had already immigrated to Harvard. They offered him the job. IIT offered him the job of dean of the School of Architecture. So he came in 1938 on a borrowed passport, because the Nazis had confiscated his passport. He was 52 years old, and he barely spoke English. Mies would hold his position at IIT for 20 years, but his career would truly blossom on the economic prosperity and building boom after World War II. In his very first U.S. commission, he experimented with the curtain wall, the use of prefabricated, repeated industrial materials. He would build over 20 buildings on the IIT campus. However, this all culminated in the SR Crown Hall, the new home of IIT's School of Architecture. It used only a steel and glass exterior with an entrance that seemed to float on travertine steps. Windows had clear textured divides. Steel beams extended over the roof for structural support, allowing the interior to be almost devoid of columns, creating a huge open space brilliantly filled with windows. Mies called this universal space, and it was revolutionary for how the space could be limitlessly modifiable. Outside IIT, the Farnsworth House was completed in 1951. Here he translated his style to a rural summer house. This was for nephrologist Edith Farnsworth, commissioned in 1945. Their relationship became infamous. Initially, it was friendly and it um, became almost professional. Uh, the story goes that she met me at a cocktail party or a dinner in the early 1940s. Apparently a great party guy, conversationalist at dinner parties, and the more he drank, the funnier the stories became. What resulted was a masterwork. The simple colors and elegant proportions allow three long horizontal white lines to dominate the design. The house seems to rise above its surrounding landscape, inviting it in with huge glass plates. The simple exterior is echoed with a heated travertine floor on the interior, which is today adorned with Mies Design furniture. But soon, building costs ran far beyond budget, and Farnsworth began to dislike Mies, even bringing a lawsuit against him at one point. He refused to visit the home after completion. But what made Mies an international superstar was 1958 Seagram Building in New York City. Instead of horizontal lines, false I-beams soared up, emphasizing their height. They also gave the building an incredibly complex texture. The building is beautifully dark despite using bronze, a coating makes it look like steel. Windows use a proportion pleasing and natural to the eye, while the lobby is composed of solid glass and travertine cubes. Shade is provided by a second story suspended over the first. This embodied his mantra, God is in the details and less is more. In his last years, Mies left IIT as his popularity met commissions were pouring in from all over the world. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe died on August 19, 1969. So we returned to Southern Illinois. Most of the buildings here on campus were brought over by SIU's president from 1948 to 1970, Delight Morris. Morris believes in education for all and an exterior classroom, which fit international styles free-flowing space. And glass was cheap. So perhaps it all boils down to price. But it could never have happened without the free exchange of ideas from Wright to Mies to Morris. Architecture belongs to the epoch. That is the essence of the epoch. And that is the only thing we really can express and what is worth to express. And I understood that. 
I would not be for fashion in architecture. I would look for more profound principles. Hello, I'm Carson Wong, the director and writer of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, Builder of Cities. I'd just like to note that the film you've just seen was cut down to 10 minutes for submission into the Illinois History Fair. In the following days, um, I'm going to be releasing a series of extras with some highlights of the hours of interviews that had to be cut out. Uh, they contain a unique insight into Mies and architecture. I think you'll enjoy them.